believe that was given of God. You know, there's nothing like a song to fix a message. I had a dear gospel singer, David Davis, who used to come with me in my campaigns. And he said, Roy, when you preach, people sometimes argue with you in their minds. But when I sing, they don't argue. <laughs> it gets in on our unguarded side. And when God gives a song to sum up a theme, a message, then it's his way of getting it into our hearts. It's very, very fun. I'm sure that will grow upon us. Amen. Well, now I hardly perhaps need to ask you to turn once again to Habakkuk 3. You know your way there and you've heard it so often. You can if you like, uh, but we perhaps shall turn to other scriptures too. But this is our fifth study in this verse and truths related to it. At first, I thought that I'd really finished yesterday. And I thought, well, all I'm going to do, the last thing, is simply to read as nicely as I can, in your hearing, those three great prayers of national penitence. Daniel 9, Ezra 9, and Nehemiah 9. I don't think I'll have time to do that. Now the Lord's opened up other important concluding aspects, but I do want to urge you, do go back to those. Read them solemnly. They're very, very moving. And all the things we've spoken of are there. In effect, that's what Daniel prayed in raw. Remember mercy, and God did. And that captive people were brought back again through the, de through the decree of Cyrus. And this was what Ezra prayed, in effect. When he discovered that restored people had failed God again and had transgressed his commandment and had begun to intermarry with the Gentiles who would in turn have led them back to idolatry. And he was so shocked. And he sat down astonished. He didn't wait for them to pray. He prayed. And when they saw him mourning as, they did, as he did. And praying as he did. Conviction spread upon the whole people. And there was a dissolving of these wrong and illicit marriages. And all the way in which he prays. Very sweet moving. In effect he prayed in raw. We're incurring the anger of the Lord. We've known something of it before. Are we again going to imperil the little reviving he's already given us? We certainly have incurred it potentially, but Lord, in the midst of wrath, remember mercy. And God did. Amen. When you ask this prayer and ask for mercy, you get it. When you go this way, the answer is so certain, for he delights in mercy. And when the Levites in Nehemiah prayed their prayer, they go over the whole history of their nation. How they've disobeyed the Lord and turned from him, and how his fierce anger has been kindled against them, and how they've been taken captive. And uh, they too are in peril of deviating even after their restoration. And those Levites prayed another great national prayer of repentance. I think we can learn how to repent. Great thing to know, how to repent. We're told how to win souls, how to read our Bibles. There are an awful lot of know-how Christian books out today. I think the one, one of the most important things to know how is how to repent. And we can learn so much from this, that great chapter in Nehemiah 9. Well, that's for your own personal study. And I think if you do, in your daily readings, one well, of the next few days, I'm just going to get, uh, I'll stop my usual course and we'll have a go. You may not get through the whole of, whole of one of them in one day. You might. It just depends how much you meditate upon it as you do. But there's a lovely study for you when you get back home. Now this morning, 
and seen their, their souls so many things. Pam and I were talking. I said, Pam, that's it. And you know, I was putting on my tie and doing this, that, and the other, and the Lord was making his revelation to our hearts. First of all, I want to deal and talk about and open up the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ in the context of this verse. And then I want to go on to think of how God does indeed revive his work when we humble ourselves along the line of this prayer in wrath, Lord. Remember mercy. And then I want to go on to the whole question of suffering. Of course, it's a huge su a subject, but just the question of suffering in the context of this verse. For some have asked me questions, and I realized we've touched on things in a very cursory way there, and might have given rise to misunderstandings. But it by no means is our looking at the question of suffering just to clear up a few things and questions. I believe there's something very positive, sweet, good for us in what the Lord has in his word along that line. And the first thing we've got to say about the cross of our Lord Jesus, if there's mercy, it's a mercy based on justice. A justice which was satisfied at the cross of Jesus. In Lord, remember mercy, that mercy which is sprinkled with the blood, which makes it sure to me, which makes it honorable to thee to bestow it upon me. I've said more than much how much I, with many of you, appreciate the little book, Daily Light. If you haven't possessed yourself of a copy, I would urge you to do so. There's a small edition, which was the original in India paper, the larger one, the cheaper one, and the larger print uh, in paperback. For years it wasn't even known in America, but now it is. This particular edition has got a, a foreword by Billy Graham. He's got excited about it now. Well, we've known it, of course, for a few generations. <laughs> and I think I said how the marvellous thing is the juxtaposition of text. Oh, by the way, talking about getting yourself, I think they're pretty well out of them. Just a few copies left in the book bookstore. But order it. Add a little bit for the postage, and you'll get it without fail. Uh, Warren Eccles will be only delighted to do that for you. I have said about this amazing juxtaposition of text. It was got out by the Baxter family, a godly pastor and his grown family, before they went to bed each night, they were given the leading text, and then they each in their morning devotions sought other texts from other parts of the Bible that bore on the leading text. And out of that, those lists of uh, texts, prayed over, revised, for many years came this precious book. And on the evening of February the 23rd, the leading text is, Who hath known the power of thine anger. And you drop your eyes to the bottom of the page, you have the reference. Psalm 90. Great psalm, not of David, but of Moses. And in that psalm he asks this question, Who hath known the power of thine anger? What a question! Who has ever known the full power of the fierce anger of the Lord against sin? Well, that's the leading text. Next text. From the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eni, lama sabachthani, that is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Next text. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And all this under the heading, Who hath known the power of thine anger? Who? Who's ever known it? 
Only one person has ever known the full power of the anger of God against sin. And that was his beloved son, Jesus. About the ninth hour, he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because there he was in the form of sinful flesh. God wasn't judging his son as the son, but his son in the form, in the likeness of sinful flesh. It was sinful flesh. It was sin that he was judging. But Jesus wore our likeness and bore our curse. But he not only knew the power of the anger of God, but he exhausted it. Jesus said, it's finished. It's finished. The anger of God against sin has burnt itself out in me. And there's a place where the fire has been and been exhausted where sinners can stand and be at peace with the Holy God. There's a story that we often tell. I'm not the only one who tells it. Pam tells it. We have, a, we have an arrangement. Are you going to tell that story of mine when we're having meetings together? And many others. I don't know where I got it. And I hope I'm telling it right because we've got a Canadian here. Because it's about the Canadian prairies. And, of course, in hot weather, dry weather, there's always the hazard of great prairie fires. And when the wind is blowing, and the land is so flat and everything is so dry, there could be great mighty walls of flame that spread with extraordinary rapidity across the, ferry, the prairie. And sometimes all the people do, can do is to take what possessions they can and flee. And the old days before everybody had a car out there, it was a perilous business. They had to do it on their two feet or on the horse and buggy or something to escape the onrush of these flames. Their homes would go. Their flocks would go. Their stock. The farm animals would go. They wanted to escape for their lives. And sometimes the wall of fire was, was gaining on them. And the only thing they could do is something which is sometimes still done. They would light a great bit stretch of the ground in front of them and stand back and let the, the fire whip that flame further forward until there was a great burnt-out patch in which they would stand. And when the, great, the main wall of fire came, it skirted them and left them safe and went beyond. And you and I are called to stand where the fire has been. Jesus was not only the, the only one who knew and experienced the power of the anger of God, but hallelujah, he exhausted it, so there's none for you. We had an experience of that last week, or the week before that, and uh, I hate to make you a little bit jealous, but we've had the most wonderful first and second week. So hot, and so dry. And we had a, a bush fire in the ground. Hey, there was some excitement. Any number of fire engines were there. All of us were doing something or other to try and put out the flames. And you can see where the fire has been, round behind the headmistress's uh, house. Mercifully, it didn't actually reach a bit building. If the, if the wind had been blowing the other way, it's no doubt at all that Nightingale would have gone up and been finished. But it was just prevented in time. Actually, the wind was going the other way and it didn't reach the headmistress's house. But we noticed, as we were all trying to do our bit, though, of course, it was the professionals that really did, dealt with it properly, we saw all sorts of rabbits running for their lives out of where the fire was spreading. I want to tell those rabbits, <laughs> it's safe now there. 
You can go back. There's not much to eat, granted. But the fire's been. And you rabbits, you can go back there. Pass that way without fear. And so we have that illustration not only from Canada, but from Southwell. And you know, dear one, he was the first to know the full blast of the anger of God against human sin. So much so you've got prophetic words of Jesus along this line. I'm thinking of that verse, you didn't turn to it, because only because it takes us time. I've got it, it's all right. Lamentations, the book of Lamented, dear Jeremiah's sorrows, over all that fell upon his people. And he speaks sort of poetically with the voice of Israel. And it proves to be the voice also of Messiah. And chapter 1, verse 12, Is it nothing to you, O ye that pass by? Behold and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow which is done unto me wherewith the Lord hath afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. If you find it difficult to take that phrase, fierce anger, so did Jesus. That's what happened at Calvary. The day of his fierce anger was the day at, of that old rugged cross where the anger of the God fell on him, but thank God, burnt itself out. And you can pray that prayer in wrath, remember mercy. And no, if you take that low place suggested by that verse, you're going to get it. But only because of Jesus. Only because of the power of the blood it comes to you sprinkled with precious blood. And that's why it's so certain to you. And that is the reason why that the anger of the Lord expressed in the various ways we've suggested is never punitive in its intention but only restorative. It isn't a punishment. That word punitive, maybe it's the sort of not the sort of word you normally use, but that's what, it isn't a punishment. It's not to be regarded as a legal punishment. You've done something wrong, now this is what's coming to you. That aspect was forever finished at the cross. That's where the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives, he's got to confess what he is and go by faith and stand where the fire's been at Calvary. This has happened to me. Is God punished me? No. It's only the unenlightened who, who, who say that. A relative of ours died of cancer, a painful death, and she died believing that God was punishing her for her secret unfaithfulness to her husband. That wasn't enough to punish such a sin as that. The only adequate punishment was that, was that which Jesus bore in his body on the tree and finished. Oh, come, tell me, what do these other things mean? They're restorative in his intention, designed to restore you, to provoke repentance where it's need, to provoke humbling, to help us to pray this prayer. And when we get as low as that in humility, mercy is absolute assured. Mercy sprinkled with the blood of Jesus. Ezra, in, in his chapter 9 bit, he says, Thou hast punished us less than our iniquities deserved. Therefore, he felt that whatever chastening they had endured, it bore no relation to their sins. Infinite less. But Ezra, he's not even punishing you. He's restoring you. Punishment, the legal aspect, is only for those outside of Christ who die in defiance at the great white throne. Even for the unconverted, 
God is using every means to provoke the prodigal to come home. Even ways of hardship and judgment and far country famines and so on. What we've got to do when we find what? He's hid his face from me. Everything has gone dead and down. I find myself in unaccountable defeats and problems. I find that he shut up heaven, that there isn't any rain. No rain upon my soul or on the word is to seek his face and ask him why. That's what Joshua did. Wherefore hast thou brought this upon us, this defeated day? God told him. And then, he then had the, pro- the, 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 the possibility, the opportunity of saying, all right, Lord, I, I, I'll recognize that this thing we're in, this deadness, this, 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 this blight, whatever it is, and my, there are sorts of things. He's longing to bring us to the place where we'll humble ourselves and say in wrath, I admit it, and I don't quarrel with, it, with you bringing it, Thou hast done right in all thou hast brought upon us, in all thou hast brought upon me personally or upon my church, but in wrong. Remember mercy, which of course it is his delight to do. And so there is the great picture of the cross, the man of sorrows, acquainting with grief, being made a curse for us, Only criminals died on crosses. He could have died on a bed on the field of battle, but it was a cross. And everybody thought he was one. He let them think it. And when they heard him say, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? There you are. I told you so. The day of God's fierce anger, but thank God, the fire's down. Nothing but peace between you and God, sinner that though we all be, And anything that may come to us otherwise is only designed to restore our souls. We have to see wherein they need to be restored. We have to acknowledge he's right in all that he's brought upon us. But with great boldness, utter assurance because of the blood of Jesus Christ, we say, remember mercy. And now passing on from that, I want to think about How God answers that prayer. Revive thy work, O Lord, is the first petition, followed by the other. And when we do humble ourselves, it's precisely that. He not only forgives us our sin, he revives his work. I believe the first thing that we need is not revival, but forgiveness. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, 2 Chronicles 7, 26... What is promised, I will hear from heaven. You're going to be heard. No, nothing first about revival. You're going to be heard. That's wonderful. Because you haven't been heard lately. Haven't felt like it, seemed like it. You're going to be heard. I will hear from heaven. He looks upon the blood. He hears you make that confession. And he hears. Secondly, and I will forgive their sin. What are you praying for? Revival. Wait a minute, you need something before revival. You need to be forgiven. And I would say, emancipated, forgiven Christians, they're so happy, they say, well, if this isn't revival, what is? Forgive their sin. And that's what you need more than more power or forgiveness, which comes as you confess through Jesus. And then heal their land. Now, that's the picture of revival, if you will. And that's what God does. I want to turn your thoughts back again to the story of Ai, Joshua 7. And we, heard, we saw that the children of Israel committed a trespass in the devoted thing. And Achan took of that which, some of which should have been destroyed and the rest should have been given to the treasury. And he hid it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. So much so that at their next encounter with the enemy, little Ai they were put to the worst. And this was a tremendous thing for Joshua. And what a beautiful prairie phrase. I tell you, 
There's some, some wealth here. That prayer. Penitence, I should say. Couldn't have got the lower. And he expressed what doubts he had. Well, we'd better, we better quit, Lord, if you're not up, not with us. Has something gone wrong up there, Lord? No, we're still up here, he said. But Israel has sinned. And in a sense, as I said, that was quite good news. He thought something had gone wrong up there. No, no, it's gone wrong down there. That's all I'm the same. And uh, they sought to find what had gone wrong. And they found it. And they judged it. It's a pretty awesome story. Might even create some difficulties in your mind, but that's what the story is. And that having been done, and a great pile of stones raised over Achan and his family. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. I have thought that's revival. It is the Lord turning from the fierceness of his anger, which has caused him to hide his face from you, which has been the cause of your AI defeats, which has been the cause of those famines, which you've known in your soul, which have made you such a difficult person and only added to your sins. He's turned from the fierceness of his anger. And he who said, neither will I be with you anymore except you destroy the accursed thing, was with them. And you know in the book of Joshua there's not one defeat recorded after that. It was victory from first to last except for the AI thing. They learned a deep lesson. And God was with them. That was revival. Oh, what a wonderful thing, friend. If it could be said of your church, the Lord has turned from the fierceness of his anger. Oh, there was so much. I tell you, there is. I tell you, there is. The flesh in the services of God is spreading itself as it does, characteristically in holy things is abomination in the sight of God and is quite enough to account for any lack of revival and the moving of his spirit in our midst. But thank God he's prepared to turn from the fierceness of his anger. He's not going to turn from the fierceness of his anger merely because <coughs> things are put right. Sin is judged by you or by others. People begin to repent. Even when you've repented of, the, of that sin, it's a terrible thing still. It hasn't changed its character. Nothing but precious blood.
and so forth. I remind you of the cleansing of the leper. That cleansing ceremony was not performed until after the man was healed. You may have stopped doing certain things. You may have changed your behavior. But the fact that you did at one time behave the way you did, that's still there until precious blood is applied to it. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. I'll tell you another wonderful revival text. I suppose I see revival everywhere. <laughs> Why not? It's all of grace, it's all of Jesus. Isaiah 12. Isaiah 12. In that day, in that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee. Though thou, this is Israel speaking, though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away and thou comfortest me. Thine anger is turned away. There's not only that. You're comforting me, says Israel. And man, when you got right with God, that love-inspired anger of his, which was only intent on your restoration, is turned away. And the sin blotted out in your soul restored to God. And then he proceeds to comfort you. Pouring it in. There was a time years ago when I was called upon to submit to a very hard, difficult thing. I can't go into the, into the details of it now. And at midnight I sat on my bed. I said, Lord, you can't. You can't mean it. Can't I? Cannot I do, not do what I will with mine own. And at about midnight or later, I bowed and I said, all right, I'll take it. And the next day was Sunday, I had to preach. What a Sunday. I could hardly preach because I was so near weeping. I couldn't read the scripture, couldn't listen to the hymns. I was near tears. Not tears of the thing, the difficulty of the thing that I'd submitted to. But he was comforting me. He was caressing me. I said, Lord, if you don't stop, I'm going to make a fool of myself in front of everybody. Comfort! Comfort! It came from all angles. Oh, this is what he does. I tell you, if this isn't a revival of one man, I don't know what is. I will praise thee, though thou wast angry with me, though you had chastening me, thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. Hallelujah. And so we can go on with other Old Testament pictures of, of, of that. Oh, it was life from the dead. When you pray that deep prayer, seeing what's gone wrong, justifying God in all the difficulty. Man, you've made a decision, a ghastly mistake perhaps, and, this, and look at the situation. It may be in your job, your finance. You were motivated perhaps by too much greed or something and you made decisions. Look at the situation. Oh, there's a way out of every such thing. Say, Lord, I admit it. And thou art right to know thou hast brought upon me, but in judgment, in mercy, in, in, in wrath, remember mercy. And you're going to get it. It may, the things, not only will you be forgiven, even the situation will God will do something about that, sometimes quite suddenly, sometimes progressively. And you emerge with the sort of testimony we've been looking at. And now, I want to pass on to a word about suffering. And we have said that this love-inspired, domestic, fatherly, anger of the Lord, sometimes, ex sometimes um, expresses itself in chastening. And I think that's the word to use here. In spite of the fact we may try and redefine our terms, that word anger is difficult to, to get out of our minds that there's something that's unclearly wrong and God is wild about it. But suffering can 
to some of the most obedient servants of the Lord, as far as we can tell. So scrupulous in their walk with God, and yet they're made to suffer along various times. Right. And such, we've all had been in Christ, so what have I done to deserve this? Is there something in which I've got astray, where I need to be restored? Is that the reason? Now listen, sometimes it is. I turn you quickly to 1 Corinthians 11. Sometimes, but not always. We shall see that. But sometimes, yes, it is. There's a case very clearly referred to in 1 Corinthians 11. And here, Paul is talking, it's the passage where the, the, last, the Lord's Supper was instituted. And he has some things, many things to say to them. Uh, as you know, the Corinthians, much was wrong in that church. But they went on with their routine. They went on with their celebration of the Lord's Supper. And in verse 29, some of them had been eating and drinking unworthily, and in doing so had drunk judgment. Not, not that condemnation, not damnation, but judgment is the right word. Chastening. Not discerning the Lord's body. It makes a difference between judgment and condemnation in this passage. And the judgment he speaks about, which we, we can bring to ourselves, is chastening judgment. That's what we've been talking about. And then he goes on to say, this judgment, this chastening, has, been called, has caused certain things. For this cause, many are weak and sickly and some sleep. That means they've caught, been called to glory. There's such a nuisance in the church. I'll, let them, I'll bring them up to heaven. They might have had many years more. But perhaps the best way out is to bring you up to heaven. Oh, we haven't lost heaven, but the church has lost a problem. And so sometimes, weakness, sickliness, or even death, is because of the sort of... It was immorality of a very gross sort, and the elders were not dealing with it. There were terrible divisions and all sorts of other excesses, and this letter was written to correct them. And he says, as a result of these things being going on, God has had to chasten his people. Once again, it's restorative. I mean, it was restorative for those who had their lives shortened. <laughs> they got to heaven, and they got it all squared with the Lord. And they're at peace. And it was restorative for the whole church. And revival was able to continue. Now sometimes it is that. Fifteen years before my wife Revel was ultimately called home on the Portway Road on the way back from Clevedon, she nearly died of a miscarriage. It really reached almost the end of the road. I didn't go into medical matters. And they had just put a drip feed in her nose with glucose and it said her, her kidneys have ceased to work. If though that doesn't work, there's nothing more. Progressively she will die. And this of course was a, a, real, a real, real, real test. God in a wonderful way blew his whistle and his hidden prayer warriors came out. And I don't know how many all over the country and in Africa heard the news and prayed and God was merciful. For myself, as I sought the Lord, I knew I'd been going on, e going easy on certain sins. I had not been judging them. Impure fantasies. And in the hour when we, one was suffering with chastening, I humbled myself. I said, Lord, I haven't been repenting of these impure chastening these impure fantasies. And the blood of Jesus covered it. And the wonderful thing happened. Her eyesight was restored. Because when the blood pressure gets to such a point, the eyes are affected. And the kidneys began to work. And God brought her again from the dead. And I always said that Revel was brought again from the dead by the blood of the everlasting covenant. Oh, that precious blood was enough for my sin. But it seemed to 
cover the whole situation. I don't know, though, but that there's many other reasons why God permitted that thing. God gave her 15 more wonderful years. But sometimes. And if you're in trouble, I should really be sure your sins are forgiven up to date. That's the thing. Be sure your sins are forgiven up to date. But that may not be in every case. Why God permits severe, sad things to happen. Now for the world, I don't know there's much of an explanation you can give. Except God is his own interpreter and he will make it plain. But for the Christian, it's all anticipated in his word. And you've got that great charter for the suffering one. Hebrews 12. The passage that speaks of the chastening of the Lord. And I do believe, perhaps, that's the word we must use in such cases. I don't know that I like to say, to comfort such an one. A verse which is indeed comforting. His anger endureth but a moment. His favour for a life. Only a moment it will seem ultimately. His favour for a lifetime. I don't know I could quote it that way. I find myself saying his chastening, his disciplining endures ultimately but a moment. His favour for a lifetime. That's what it is. And what does Hebrews 12, the great charter, say? It says, Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. And if you are without chastening, if you never have tests, it almost looks as if you're a bastard and not a true child of God. That's what it says. I'm almost quoting it, word for word. It's a mark of love. It's because he's intent on our holiness. Even in the most obedient of us, there may be new things he wants to do in our lives. New things to correct, which we didn't know were there. Or new qualities of patience, of caring for others in trouble. New gentleness. That old strong eye is just too being too strong. We don't know. He's not censuring you for that which you don't know, but he knows what you need. And he's working for our holiness. And that's the reason why it says, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous, but afterward it yieldeth the, the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. What you need to say is not why am I suffering this way, not, no, not what have I deserve, done to deserve it. You haven't. But why is he allowing it? What's he teaching me? And you'll learn bit by bit. And afterward. As you're exercised thereby. As you're willing to learn, let God speak to you. Not only comfort you, but lovingly speak to you. And what he does is will be very loving. It will yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness. How often have we not heard ministers tell us there's one member of their congregation, a sick woman, and they go to comfort her. And she's so raging in spite of her trouble, she's got right through, that it's the minister who gets comforted rather than the other way. She's a blessing. The peaceable fruit of righteousness and no rebellion that was at first maybe, but that's been settled with Jesus. And there's such sweetness and concern Oh, my dear friends, so hallelujah. Nothing's gone wrong. Heaven is still occupied by the Lamb upon the throne. Now, what are we to do? However, according to Hebrews 12, it just gives us these considerations. It's a mark of the care and love of God. And in, if that so, as I've said the other day, some of us seem to be more loved than others because they've, been, they've suffered more. It's not a mark. You're not loved. He's taking time out, trouble with you. He's got a gracious purpose. Well, what is your attitude to be when you're in that thing? 
shall we, inasmuch as we had fathers of the flesh who chastened us for our good after their own pleasure, shall we not rather be in subjection to the Father of heaven and live? Subjection. Bend the neck. He, bore the, he bowed his head for us to something far worse. He said, bow your neck. Wear my yoke. This yoke is from me, but it won't fit if you've got a stiff neck with seeds of rebellion. Learn to submit. Go through it with Jesus. And when you find yourself not, not submitting with self-pity in your heart, well, there's another sin to take to the cross of Jesus. I don't, suppose, I don't think he expects any of us to go through certain paths without having to go back and repent about attitudes that come. But be assured, no matter what the experience is you go through, the highway of holiness goes through it. You will, we can walk on that highway of holiness. Yes, especially when it first hits you, mate, you'll get off. My goodness, it, it, your mind reels when, you, when something or other happens. But the way back is there. It's sprinkled with precious blood on that highway of holiness. Every last thing that could go wrong has been anticipated by Jesus on the cross and settled to the satisfaction of God so that when something does go wrong in your attitude, he's not surprised, it's been provided for. You know Isaiah 35 is the passage that talks about the high, high, there should be a highway of holiness. It says two things. The unclean shall not pass over it. Well, that's not very encouraging because we do get unclean. Unclean don't pass over it. And even the very name, the highway of holiness, is a bit forbidding. Am I holy enough? Well, you say, who in the world do walk on it? A little later down in the passage. But the redeemed shall walk there. And who are the redeemed? Those who have more than once, more times than they like to remember, have been rendered unclean. But they have found there was blood in the, power in the blood of Jesus. It's the highway along which those the redeemed, the constantly redeemed, the cleansed, walk. I have a dear friend in Switzerland, German-speaking friend, and there was one conference years ago, the great sea, it passed from mouth to mouth. Immer erlöst. Erlöst, so I'm not pronouncing it right, am I? <laughs> Clearly. It means redeemed. Or, yes, redeemed. And Emma means ever. Continually redeemed. And even now when he meets me, he always says, Emma and us, hallelujah, the redeemed walk there. And man, there's a highway of holiness for you. Yes, there'll be many comings back to Jesus. Many things will be revealed in your heart. That's all part of the reason. The scum comes to the surface when bone soup is put on the hob. Then you can take the scum off. And we put on the hob sometimes, and the scum comes up. Jesus takes it off. And in this way, it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness. And more than that, in this period of trial, you can pray Habakkuk's prayer. Perhaps we'll check, alter its wording a bit. Perhaps for such and such a case, we will say, in this time of chastening, O Lord, Remember mercy. You delight in it. Maybe his mercy isn't going to mean the complete changing of a certain situation. As in some of the situations I've referred to, it does mean when it comes to revival. Maybe it's not going to bring a, a, a loved one back to life. But you're in need of so mercy on so much, much else. And you can see in the midst of this chastening, remember mercy. Don't ask for justice. Ask for mercy. Don't be like that man who went to the photographer and said, I hope you do me justice. He said, what you need is not justice, but mercy. Ask for mercy. All I want is justice. No, ask for mercy. Your attitude is many things. And I want to tell you, you touch him on his weak point. And you're going to have mercy, abundance and gloriously compensating in the difficult path you're called to work the to walk. And so here's our great loving text. O oh Lord, remember mercy. Let us bow our heads in prayer.
We want to thank thee, dear Lord, for mercy. Brought to us by Jesus at such cost. And we want to thank thee for all that we've heard. We can only ask thee, interpret it each to our hearts. So that we've, it's been as if you yourself have been counselling us as we've listened. And may the end be joy and peace. Even, be, even though may be there have been a few tears and may yet be others. But we thank you. We can be amongst those who can say, Thine anger is turned away from me. And thou comfortest me. We think of the comforts of God. Isaiah said, comfort ye, comfort ye my people. They've been through it. They've received of the Lord's hand double for all their sins. But now the hour of comfort's come. The hour of renewal. The hour of revival. The hour of joy. So Lord, may we all get into that in these days. In this day, our last day together. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's try and sing our chorus again. Uh...